All right, ready to shrink down to microscopic size. Today, we're diving deep into the fascinating world of cell communication. It's amazing, isn't it, to think that even the simplest organisms like uh, bacteria and yeast are constantly sending and receiving messages. Really? So it's not just about, you know, like impalus escaping cheetahs. Even single-celled organisms are like chatting it up. Absolutely. They're coordinating, well, everything, really. Finding food, forming communities. It's all thanks to cell signaling. Okay, so what is cell signaling exactly? It's basically how cells receive, process, and then respond to information from their environment and each other. Okay, I'm hooked. So how does this all work? Imagine cells are like individuals at a party, right? Okay. They're sending out invitations, signals, looking for the right guests to connect with, the receptors. Oh, oh okay. Once they find a match, it sets off, well, like a chain reaction, you know, transduction, leading to all sorts of activities like dancing, conversations, maybe even a conga line. I love that analogy. Yeah. So these invitations, these signals, what are they made of? They can be a variety of molecules, like hormones, proteins, even gases. What's really fascinating is that each signal has a specific target, just like an invitation is addressed to a particular guest. So that's where receptors come in, right? Like, they're the bouncers at the door, only letting in the right guests. Precisely. And just like there are different types of parties, there are different types of receptors. G-protein coupled receptors, GPCRs, are, uh, I guess you could say, like the popular kids, involved in a wide range of processes. Those are the ones we hear about a lot. What makes them so special? Well, for one, their structure. They have these seven transmembrane helices, so they basically weave in and out of the cell membrane seven times. This allows them to interact with a variety of signaling molecules and then, you know, trigger different responses inside the cell. Well, that sounds complicated. It is. What other important receptors are there? Another key player is receptor tyrosine kinases, or RTKs. Um, they're like the multitaskers. They can activate multiple signaling pathways simultaneously. Keeping things lively. But yeah. why is that so important? Well, think about complex processes like cell growth and division. These processes require a coordinated effort with multiple signals and pathways all working together. RTKs are essential for making sure everything runs smoothly. Okay, got it. So we have all these different receptors receiving these signals. What happens next? That's where the real action begins. Now the signal needs to be relayed within the cell. This is where transduction comes in. You can think of it like a game of telephone where the message is passed from one molecule to the next. So the party's getting wild and the word is spreading. Exactly. And one of the key mechanisms involved is phosphorylation. Proteins get tagged with phosphate groups. It's like a relay race where each runner gets a burst of energy, the phosphate group, when they receive the baton. I can picture it, the energy building with each pass. But what about when the party needs to end? How does that happen? Well, turning off the signal is just as important as turning it on. And that's where these enzymes called phosphatases come in. They're like the cleanup crew, removing those phosphate groups, making sure the signal doesn't keep going forever. So it's all about balance, making sure the message is amplified when needed, but then shut down when it's time to call it a night. Exactly. And this balance is really crucial for regulating the cellular response, making sure that the cell acts appropriately to the signal it received. This is already blowing my mind. But I've heard about these second messengers. What do they do? Ah, uh, those are the VIPs of the party. They're small molecules that can rapidly diffuse within the cell, and they basically amplify the signal, triggering all sorts of responses. So they're like the town criers, making sure everyone gets the message. Exactly. Two of the most well-known are cyclic AMP, or FEMP, and calcium ions. They're like messengers sprinting through the cytoplasm. Wow, just zipping around, getting everyone excited. So we've got... The signals, the receptors, the relay race of transduction, and then these speedy messengers. What's the ultimate goal of all this communication? It all leads to a specific cellular response, the grand finale of the party. It could be anything, really. Turning genes on or off, activating enzymes, even triggering more complex behaviors like cell growth or division or even movement. It's not just about sending messages then. It's yeah. about taking action. Can you give me an example of a cellular response? Absolutely. Think about what happens when you encounter a stressful situation. Okay. Your body releases adrenaline, also known as epinephrine. 
This hormone acts as a signal binding to receptors on various cells throughout your body. So the adrenaline is like a danger signal. Right. And one of the key responses is in your liver cells. They start breaking down glycogen, which is a stored form of glucose, and release that glucose into your bloodstream. This gives your muscles the energy they need to, you know, fight or flee. Oh, so it's like the signal is telling the liver cells to fuel up for action. Exactly. And what's fascinating is that a small amount of epinephrine can actually trigger the release of millions of glucose molecules. That's the power of signal amplification through these pathways. Okay, that's amazing. From a single signal, this incredible cascade of events leading to a powerful and coordinated response. It is pretty amazing. That's the beauty of cell communication. It allows cells to sense their environment, make decisions, and respond in a way that benefits the entire organism. This is incredible. I can't wait to, you know, dive deeper into the specifics of how these pathways are regulated and, you know, how it can all go wrong. Oh, yeah, there's a lot more to explore. Welcome back. So we were talking about how cells respond to these signals, but what happens when things go wrong? Like can a cell, I don't know, self-destruct? They can. It's called apoptosis, and it's this, well, carefully controlled process of programmed cell death. Okay, that sounds kind of intense. Why would a cell need to, like, self-destruct? Well, it's actually really crucial for development, getting rid of damaged cells and even preventing the spread of infection. Huh. So it's like a built-in quality control system. Exactly. And to understand how it works, scientists looked at this tiny worm called C. elegans. A worm. Why a worm? Well, it's got a pretty simple structure and its development is really predictable. You know, scientists were able to trace uh, the lineage of every single cell. And what they found was uh, apoptosis happens exactly 131 times during the worm's development. Whoa, that's like a perfectly choreographed dance of life and death. It is. And by studying C. elegans, researchers actually uncovered these key genes and proteins involved in regulating apoptosis, like uh, SED3, SED4, and SED9. Okay. These genes were like the foundation for understanding how apoptosis works in, you know, more complex organisms, including us. So this tiny worm holds the secrets to uh, a process that's fundamental to all life. That's pretty. It is. And what's really amazing is that while the uh, specifics of the pathways might vary, the basic principles are very similar across species. So how does this self-destruct button actually get pressed? Like what triggers it? The signals can come from uh, both inside and outside the cell. External signals could be, you know, like death signaling molecules, you know, released by neighboring cells, basically telling the cell, hey, it's your time to go. It's like an eviction notice from your neighbors. Yeah. What about internal signals? Internal signals can come from a lot of different sources. For instance, if a cell's DNA is really damaged, it can trigger this pathway that leads to apoptosis. Makes sense. Also, problems with protein folding or other cellular stresses can activate the uh, self-destruct sequence. So the cell has these internal sensors that like monitor its health. And if things are like beyond repair, it's like flip the switch. Right. And remember those cast bases we talked about earlier? They play a central role in uh, actually executing apoptosis. They're like the demolition crew. Oh, right, right. So we have these internal and external signals that can trigger it. And cast bases are the ones carrying out the uh, demolition. Mm. But how is this whole thing regulated? Like what prevents cells from just, you know, randomly self-destructing? That's where those other said genes come in. Said 9, for example, acts as a break preventing apoptosis when there isn't a death signal. It keeps the caspase, said three, in check. So it's like a safety mechanism. Exactly. And when a death signal does come along, it inactivates said nine. So it basically releases the break and then the uh, apoptotic cascade can go ahead. This is really incredible. But I have a question. What happens to all that like cell debris after apoptosis? Yeah. It can't just stay there, can it? That's a great question. Apoptotic cells actually display these uh, eat me signals on their surface. And these signals attract phagocytic cells. These are cells that engulf and digest cellular debris. Oh, so they're like the cleanup crew. Exactly. They come in, they remove the debris, and this prevents, you know, inflammation or other harmful responses. Wow. It's amazing how every step of this process is so organized. And to think we learned all this from a tiny worm. It really shows how even the smallest organisms can, you know, give us a lot of insight into the complexity of life. This has been an incredible journey so far, and I'm uh, I'm excited to explore the, you know, practical implications of all this. Like, how does understanding cell communication and uh, things like apoptosis impact our lives? Well, that's where things get even more exciting. So we've been on this incredible journey exploring this, like, 
intricate world of cell communication. Yeah, from those molecular invitations and, you know, bustling cellular parties to the uh, drama of programmed cell death. And now I'm really curious to see how all this knowledge, you know, translates into uh, real world applications. Well, one area where it's making a huge impact is medicine. Yeah, I bet. I mean, so many diseases are caused by, you know, disruptions in these cellular pathways. Exactly. And by understanding those disruptions, you know, we can develop more targeted and um, effective therapies. So instead of using a sledgehammer, we're using a scalpel. Right. Precisely. One example is personalized medicine. That's where uh, treatments are tailored to an individual's, you know, specific genetic makeup and their disease. That sounds like the future. Can you give me an example of how that works? Let's take cancer, for example. By identifying the specific signaling pathways that are uh, driving tumor growth in a patient, we can develop drugs that, you know, selectively target those pathways. So instead of using traditional chemotherapy, which can harm healthy cells too, mm. we can use more targeted therapies that are, you know, more precise and have fewer side effects. That's the goal. And we're already seeing a lot of success, like with drugs like Herceptin, which targets a specific receptor involved in some types of breast cancer. Wow, that's amazing. So by understanding the language of cells, we can actually intercept and, uh, modify their messages. Exactly. It's like we have this, you know, secret decoder ring. And it's not just cancer, right? This knowledge is also helping us fight infectious diseases. Absolutely. Many bacteria and viruses actually hijack our own cellular pathways to, you know, to gain entry into our cells and replicate. So it's like they're hacking into our communication system. Right. But by understanding how they do this, we can develop strategies to, you know, to block their entry or uh, disrupt their replication. Like installing a firewall That's to it? protect ourselves. Exactly. And this knowledge is leading to all sorts of new antiviral and antibacterial drugs. It's amazing, isn't it? Un understanding something so small can have such a huge impact on our health. It really is. And yeah. the possibilities don't end there. Researchers are also looking at, you know, ways to manipulate cell communication to regenerate tissues and organs. Wow. So we could potentially regrow damaged organs just by like controlling those cellular conversations. That's the hope. I mean, it's still early, but there's been some really promising progress, especially in areas like uh, bone and cartilage regeneration. That would be incredible. Imagine a future where you know, organ transplants are a thing of the past. Yeah, it's exciting. And the applications go beyond medicine, too. Understanding cell communication is also important for agriculture. Really? How so? Well, by uh, by manipulating plant cell signaling, we can develop crops that are more resistant to pests or diseases or, you know, that require less water and produce higher yields. So we can basically engineer smarter plants. Mm -hmm just by tweaking their cellular conversations. Exactly. And that could have, you know, a huge impact on global food security. Wow. It's amazing to think that these microscopic conversations are like shaping the future of medicine, agriculture, and, you know, maybe even the planet. It really highlights the interconnectedness of everything, you know, and the importance of understanding these fundamental processes. Well, this has been a truly mind-blowing deep dive into the world of cell communication. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your expertise. It's been a pleasure. We've learned how cells send and receive these messages, how they respond to signals, and even how they uh, make those life or death decisions. Right, through apoptosis. Exactly. And we've also seen how this knowledge is leading to all sorts of incredible advancements in medicine, agriculture, and beyond. It's really inspiring. It is. So the next time you, you know, you marvel at the complexity of life, remember those silent conversations happening inside every single cell. The molecular whispers that, you know, orchestrate the symphony of life. Beautifully put. Thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive. Until next time, keep exploring and stay curious.